Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Paul. It's great to be here with you again at OC Talk Radio after a couple weeks off working in Uganda, Africa. There is uh, nothing that enriches my soul more than serving the poorest of the poor, people that live on less than $2 a day in the most rural of villages. And believe me, Rural is grossly understated. They live on dirt floors and one-room houses with no electricity, no running water, no toilet, and most often 10 to 20 miles from any form of what might be called an urban town. And believe me, we wouldn't think of it as urban, but it has electricity, so it gets to be urban. And now today, uh, I'm with with a guest I haven't had on the show for two and a half years a guest who changed my life, and we'll talk about that more later on. But today I'm visiting uh, with my fellow traveler traveler to Uganda, CEO and founder of Wells of Life, Nick Jordan. Nick is a nonprofit, uh, uh, Wells of Life is a nonprofit NGO with the mission to bring access to clean water as well as transforming villages to adopt adequate sanitation and hygiene practices. By the end of 2019, check this out, Wells of Life will have installed more than 500 clean water wells in Uganda, serving 500,000 people, and according to our calculations, saving the lives of nearly 32,000 children under six years old, and probably in the neighborhood of 50,000 people in total of lives saved. Now, Nick was born and raised in Ireland and holds a bachelor's degree from the University from Univer- University College in Dublin. In the 1980s, Nick immigrated to the United States and has proudly earned his citizenship as a devout American. Uh, in our show today, I want to discuss passion and passion around giving. So um, it's passion with a purpose to make a difference on this oh-so-needy planet rather than passion for self-service. I And I personally do not know anyone more passionate about serving the poor than Nick Jordan. So let's find out what Nick Jordan has to say about passion with a purpose. Nick Jordan, welcome to the next chapter with Charlie. Thank you, Charlie, for the invite. It's lovely to be here. Good. Good to have you with us. Um you, you know, we should say, well, I'm going to wait. I'm going to tell the story later. Uh, I, I want to get into you right away. Um, just about a decade ago, Nick, you were a wealthy, a very wealthy real estate entrepreneur when you decided to found a nonprofit that eventually focused on providing access to clean water to the rural communities of Uganda. Uh, can you tell me the story of how Wells of Life began? Well, briefly put, Charlie, uh, it's very nice of you to say uh, that kind remark, but uh, it unfortunately misses the mark just slightly. And what I can tell everybody listening is that I was a fortunate individual working in real estate, uh, an immigrant who had come and emigrated to America in the mid-'80s, as you mentioned, became a citizen in 2004, and uh, found out that a recession was a horrible thing to happen when you were holding a lot of real estate. What actually happened was that uh, essentially in 2007 and eight, with the recession that came, I went broke. And that opened a door into my life that um, I walked through with some level of reluctance. And that took me to Uganda to a visit uh, over two weeks to rural Uganda, where I saw a different part of life, one that I had never before witnessed. And that essentially was the introduction to poverty, the effects of lack of water, and an opportunity to actually do something about it. Now, you were originally uh, building schools, were you not? Indeed. I was a school teacher, first of all, in Ireland. Always had a belief that education was, was the key that unlocked essentially any door. So I believe it was natural enough during the time I was a real estate agent and broker uh, to be able to give a little back which equated to four schools being built in Uganda from 2005. And the schools were just a natural answer to the need for education. 
It was through another Irish NGO. And uh, I decided that uh, we could put some people together, build some schools without really having any understanding or knowledge of what I was doing. It was with the, the right type of intention. But as I later found out, you need to know a lot more about what you do before you actually do it when it comes to uh, rural Uganda. Yeah, you, and you find out along the way. Uh, I must mention, just so everybody knows, that an NGO will be using that term a lot. It's non-governmental organization, and it's really people doing service that is not attached to the government, but it, but it's they're very service-oriented organizations, and that's we we have an NGO in Uganda and an NGO in Ireland and one in the United States. Uh, but but now, you know, you were doing the schools. What turned you to water? What, what was what was it about water that that made that sort of caught your your attention and your passions? Well, two weeks of traveling through rural Uganda caught my attention because it is, as you well now know, the most arduous uh, way you can spend uh, some time. Uh, typically, you're traveling across roads that that barely qualify as roads. And over two weeks, I visited 11 schools. And obviously, four of them I had helped, along with some very generous donors here in Orange County, raise the funds for. So I acted as their emissary just to simply go and um, meet the school children and see what difference this uh, effort was making. Well, with every school, uh, it appeared to me that there were less girls than boys. And finally, at about the third school, I finally uh, pulled somebody aside and asked, are there less girls in Uganda than boys? I was very shocked to get an answer that said, no, there should be about equal. But at this school, there's no clean water. There is no water well. So the girls are tasked with hauling water, and they often have to miss school. And for many reasons, most of which would be apparent, I thought that was very unfair and very unfair to to girls never having an opportunity to receive that education that would unlock the door. And so I decided that I was not going to build any more schools or be involved with building schools. I realized that if water could be provided to every school that the organization I had worked through had built, it would be a tremendous asset to making sure that there was equality between boys and girls. And so that really was what the founding thought of Wells of Life was about. No, you know, that's the first time I've heard that. That is, uh, that's really great. And and I think what we need to, to let the listeners know that uh, these girls and boys, boys carry water as well too, but the girls and the, and the, and the mothers are, are the prime movers. They will, they drink this water that uh, I wrote you would not even dip your fingers into. And, and if you go to wellsoflife.org, wellsoflife.org, you will see photos of the water that they drink, which is just absolutely atrocious, uh, that everybody in town, everybody in the villages has diarrhea. Uh, um, it's the largest killer. It kills more people than malaria and AIDS. And yet we get more attention on malaria and AIDS than we get on water. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. But they carry them in these what it's called five-gallon jury cans, which are uh, – uh, no, five, is it five-gallon? Yeah, yeah five-gallon. They're 40 pounds. Right. And they carry one or two. Sometimes they carry them on their head, and they have to walk up hills. They have to walk miles just to have dirty, unclean water that's giving them diarrhea, that's killing one child out of five uh, it, under, under, under six years old. And it is just, it's horrendous what they have to go through. And I can see why it became so important to you to, to provide water with these people. Well, those images never leave you. I just wanted to say that, you know, we're moved by, um, obviously, by photographs. We're often moved by, you know, provocative images. But when you actually go in person to Uganda and the image is the reality right there on the spot of a child that's sometimes no more than seven or eight years old trying to haul this weight of water that, as you described, is no, it's no better than a life sentence. 
most likely it's got all sorts of organisms in it. And you know that everything about that picture is wrong. And so the image that I could not get out of my mind in 2009 when I came back from the first trip was that how could we live in a world where the answer was so readily apparent and the water was so readily available and do nothing about it? And that was something that, much as I tried, and I assure you I did try because I did not go to Uganda to leave a career in real estate. My full and complete attention was going to be on getting reestablished as a real estate broker and developer after the recession. But I could never look at the world in the same way after seeing what I saw in Uganda in 2008. And that, I believe, is a picture that many people take back from their trip to Uganda, which I know you'll talk about a little bit later. But that is the driving force of what is at the very center of the Wells of Life mission. As I look around at the charities in the United States, and and I think people should know that of all the charities given in the United States, only 3%, 3.4% is given to international, international aid. aid. Uh, so it's 96 or 97% is given to the U.S., which is nothing wrong with that. I mean, you, you know, you, you, you want to help your people, your, but, but... Um, we could do better than 3%. And, and when so many people are dying, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, it is, it is such, a, such a, a, a needy place. And I wonder, this has occurred to me, and you and I have discussed it, why so many major charities, and I'm not going to mention the major charity's name, but we're talking big-time charities, uh, seem to ignore... The problem of water in the world when the United Nations just recently has declared the lack of access to clean water as the number one cause of poverty in the world. The lack of access to clean water is the number one cause of poverty in the world. And so I wrote, what the hell am I missing here? I mean, you, you, you know, this is, you know, we worry about... Uh, we worry about things, that, trying to find solutions to things that we can't, you know, like cancer. I believe in cancer. It's not that I don't believe in these in cancer research, but we can provide clean water. All the, the only problem is, is money. We have all the technology in the world to take care of that. What, what am I missing here, Nick? Well, I share your same frustration, and I think this is one of the greatest opportunities that exists within our current decade. And sometimes I'll also say that the solution is right under our noses, and that is indeed the case here because we've both learned the hard way uh, coming back from Uganda, even after ingesting a tiny little drop of unsafe water, just what it can do to a human being. But the possibilities that exist by making water a basic human right, which incidentally it is, but by simply standing up in unison and saying, this is something that we can all do, but we have to add our voice to it. I don't think that government is always the answer. I know that probably sounds like a naive statement, but when we talk about government and the monies that are given to governments in Uganda and every other country, that doesn't essentially guarantee anything. Yeah. But I do want to just submit that this is, is an opportunity for all of us, man and woman, the people that have ordinary lives like ourselves. They can really make a huge imprint on the world by changing how people view access to water. Yeah, it's, it's you know, when I, when I discovered that it was the number one cause of poverty and yet we're doing so little about it internationally, not just you know, not just not just the United States. So little about it internationally, it just it shocks me. I, I I don't I don't quite understand that. But I want to get to our topic today, and we're talking we're talking about passion with a purpose, and and I I, I think I think that's a driver, and um, of to to this. And I had I'm looking for a question that I had here, and. And um, um, and it was oh it's this, you are, 
you know, you listen to you, you, you speak about, about wells of life and the need for water so frequently, and you, you do a lot of public speaking and a lot of events and talking to people, and, and your passion. We became close with the prime minister of Uganda, of, of the Buganda, of a kingdom in Uganda, and he said it was mostly just your passion that made him join. Um, what role do you feel passion has to play in getting wealth of life where it is today? Well, that's a difficult one for me to answer, Charlie, because um, I know what passion means, and I certainly know that it is important. I think it's something that I've always had, you know, even from being a child. I was the oldest of five kids, and I, I never lacked a voice. I certainly used it adequately. And that meant, you know, being able to emigrate on my own and make a success here in America. But that didn't really give me the type of voice that I wanted to have, which was a voice of compassion. And so I believe what Wells of Life has given me that I don't think I could have received from any other work was the passion of knowing that this is focused effort and focused in- intention. And it is a driver where... I believe people will not support any cause until they feel that the person that's presenting it truly believes in it themselves. And I think that's one of the things that I've tried to show that I'm willing to do this work until my last breath. I really believe that without making any big deal about it, that I feel really called and blessed to be involved with Wells of Life because when we've seen the effort that it takes, it's minimal, con- minimal, I should say, considering the results that we receive. Happy children, mothers that thank you with embraces that, that would just warm your heart, changing the entire community because you just cared enough to bring water. I just consider myself very fortunate and very blessed to be able to do this work. And if passion helps me get to another listener out there, I'm willing to give it everything I've got. And if that's what passion is, then I say, well, good. Yeah, and that is what passion is. I'm I'm thinking, uh, I go back to my story, and we had you on the podcast March 4th. You had the date, March 4th. March 16th, just before St. Patrick's Day. Is, we were joking about St. Patrick's Day, so it was the day previous to and St. Patrick's And was that in, set, in 17? In March 17. March 17. Um, you were on the show. And we, I knew nothing of Wells of Life, and you started telling me about Wells of Life, and then the next thing I knew is, is I said, well, we have a couple extra dollars, so we, so we, we contributed to building a couple of wells, and, and I have, I have never been, I've never been um, incited to participate in that i've seen the photographs you know you see the photographs of the of the malnourished children in africa and or in well in sudan and largely which is in in africa uh and and you know you you're filled with pity but i wasn't right. filled with passion right. to try to help them something about what you said it seemed i could help a little bit and a little bit you know, if I if I contribute to a well, it one thousand people are getting water. Now that just was all of a sudden. I'm saying, holy crap! You know, I I I give this money to United Way, and it goes to paying somebody's salary. I'm sorry, United Way. I, I really appreciate what you do, um, um, but this with this money is going directly to because it's we have we have this this rule that money given to a well, 100% of the money will be going to the well. It will not go to operations. And and I was still, I was passionate, but I was not passionate. And we'll talk about our trip until I took a trip. And then when I took a trip to Uganda and I saw the joy of the people, I saw the situation of the people, and it became my passion. I feel, Nick, that my leadership experience, my ministry experience, uh, my business experience, all of this, I just, I, I turned 70 in 10 days. And I believe that all of this God put together for me to work with Wells of Life. 
Amen. Now that's you know I've I, and, and and you know I could have five to ten years with Wells of Life, but that's but you know I'll be a part of 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 saving and and improving the quality of life of tens of thousands of people or hundreds of thousands now, um, and that is a great passion of mine. Um, now, now. I, I'm a strong believer in passion. I used to lecture on passion. I used to go out because I, I believe we are we are each driven to do things, and so I'm I'm thinking that we have listeners that are in search of a personal passion, that they would like to really be passionate about something. Um, how did you? Well, you've already explained. It. I was going to ask you how did you discover your passion for serving the poor, but. Why is that a different kind of passion, serving the poor, than than a passion for something else? You know, like like passionate for baseball. You know, I'm passionate for baseball, but it's different when I'm saving somebody's life. Well, if you'll permit me, I just wanted to backtrack a couple of steps to sure. what, something you just said because um, I I wanted to say that uh, how people view passion is not always the same. Uh, and I think your listeners know you very well. I don't really have to give any um, explanations here. I, I will say with total truth and conviction that I've never had or heard Charlie Hedges raise his voice. I've never had him, you know, yell or scream in a meeting. So maybe by the definition that he might have, you know, used here, perhaps that would say that maybe he's not passionate. That's nothing could be further from the case because I have seen more passion from Charlie Hedges in situations where life is on the line than <clears throat> many situations that I've experienced. So to, to move forward and try and give you the best answer I can here is that the, the idea of the value of passion when it connects with a cause that is so meaningful to the human being, and I stress to the human being because I believe, like you and I, we found a cause that we believed we could be used willingly by God for. Whether we succeeded or failed, it really didn't matter to us. We were willing to throw our hat into the ring and do what we were maybe best at, which was to be focused, be dedicated. And like in your situation, be a great teacher, a coach. You drew on every single skill that you had put on the shelf, because I think your listeners know that you were retired, essentially, until you were pressed back into working full-time for the Ministry of Wells of Life. And so, therefore, this passion that perhaps some people think you have to be jumping and shouting and roaring is not the case. The passion that you have and I have are exactly the same. It's just manifest in different ways by connecting with a cause that you and I believe in and that hopefully a lot of people that are your listeners want to hear more about because there's no quick answer to what is being passionate about something. I think it becomes a one-on-one conversation with that person where I ask them, what is it that you want to leave behind? What is it that you want to be known for? And what is it that you believe you can do, that you were created and put on this earth to do, that you should do right now because we may not be guaranteed tomorrow? Yeah, and especially when you have... Like like me, I had the resources, so we had we had done reasonably well in business, and we had saved well, so we had the resources. So I can work as a, I, I can do vital work as a volunteer, you know. Now, maybe maybe a thirty hour a week volunteer job, <laughs> but but it's uh, you you know it, I'm fulfilled not by a paycheck, but by a result. And that is what, that's what absolutely ref, uh, drives me now. Now, too often, I think, Nick, um, passion is limited to the arts or some kind of avocation. You know, are you passionate about your painting, your writing, your sculpting? Are, are, you, are you passionate about, about some kind of avocation, a hobby, building whatever you build you know i have a friend who's passionate about automobiles and and he's always working on his cars you know and classic cars um and and you know i highly endorse that i I, so i'm not discouraging listeners from doing that because i think that's very important to get 
your natural gifts and talents and be able to express them. But uh, nevertheless, when you help someone in need, especially in dire need, you develop a passion that is unstoppable. Once you catch that, once that bug, you catch the bug or the bug catches you, you're screwed. You, you, you know, it's, it's got you. It owns you. Uh, and it's right in line with the saying of Jesus that it is better to give than to receive. That's such a simple sentence, and yet it's one of those most profound wisdom statements in the world. And that all of us know that. We all know it's better to give than to receive. At Christmas, you know, what are we looking for? Are we looking for what we're getting, or are we looking for the joy in the faces of the pe- the people to whom we give? Now, there are some, I admit, are looking forward to giving, but they're typically seven years old. Um, so, you know, I was thinking, I was thinking of, uh, I know you have a love of singing, and you have a passionate, I would, a passion, I would say, for singing. Here's an odd question, but it just, it just, I want to bring some clarity around the matter. How would you compare your passion for singing with your passion for service? What, what is the difference there? I think that's a relatively easy one to answer, Charlie. I mean, my passion for singing extends, I would say, about as far as the shower. <laughs> and that's about it. Even if I have an Irish tenor voice, I'm not under any illusions. But my passion for wells of life and, and for saving lives and for connecting people like you and Paul and your listeners to the invitation of serving is um, it's, the, it's the spark, it's the flame, call it whatever you want. It's the engine that drives me on day after day after year. And this is the 10th year of doing this work. And I feel as passionate today about doing this work as I did on day one because the cause hasn't diminished. In fact, it's actually gotten deeper because we have gotten better at doing this work. And they say it takes 10,000 hours to become proficient or an expert at any given thing. I believe I've invested just about 10,000 hours now at leading wells of life. And what I see happening right across the board, not just to you, Charlie, because you're definitely a I would consider you to be a poster boy of what one person can do by walking in and saying, Lord, use me. But since we were sitting here two and a half years ago, we have essentially built a team, a strong team in Uganda. And that team extends to 20 plus individuals that you and I both know are willing to put their lives on the line every day in terribly difficult, challenging circumstances. So you cannot but be moved by that level of passion amongst people because you know that you're hanging out with, with people that are truly changing the world. In addition to that, you know, we've established ourselves in Ireland, which, of course, I'm delighted and happy and proud to say that, you know, that's my native country. And that is a growing force because there's nowhere on this earth that um, giving doesn't uh, hold the possibility. And Wells of Life wants to invite every single human being just to be open to the possibility that they could be used for a mighty purpose. And that purpose can be something as simple as just saving one child's life. And if you've done that in your lifetime, I will willingly submit to you that you've lived a mighty life. That's great. Uh, I, and and I, I want to talk a little bit about um, trips to Uganda. But before I do that, we need to take a break, Paul. So let's uh, take a brief break, and we'll come back, and we'll talk about trips to Uganda. Hi there, this is uh, the next chapter with Charlie, and it's Charlie Hedges saying welcome. And we are here with my dear friend Nick Jordan, who is founder and CEO of Wells of Life. Our mission is to provide access to clean water 
to people in rural, very rural Uganda. And and the results, uh, you know, are amazing. I think one of the one of the things that really drives me in working in Africa is a return on investment. I give money in the United States and I get X results. I give money internationally, not through a government. Believe me, you know, we know better than working through governments, but directly with the organizations that are doing the work. And we get 10x or 100x. <laughs> you, you know, it's, it's, you know, the impact is entire villages are impacted, not, not a family. You know, it, it's, it's entire groups of families that, that are impacted. Now, one of the things we do at Wells of Life, and I say we because I don't know if I already mentioned, but I am vice president of operations in Uganda, although a volunteer, but still running operations there. And one of the things that we do is take donors and interested people on a challenging trip to rural Uganda. And we we try to tell them what they're getting themselves into, and they say, oh, I can take it, I can take it. Then they get there and they go, whoa. Um, but but it, it's, still, it's still livable. I mean, it's still, it's still bearable. It's not, it's not unbearable. You're not living in a tent somewhere and with a kerosene lantern. Um, uh, we, have, we have the Mackin Hill Resort, which is, uh, resort is used rather loosely. <laughs> now, now, we just returned from a trip last week, but by the time the show airs, it, it'll be uh, a couple of weeks. And we, we returned near Labor Day from one such trip where we were a couple of weeks in Uganda with how many donors? Did we have five or six? Yeah, we had six donors. Six six donors or interested people. I think all all were all had made some kind of donation, and um, I, I have a couple of questions regarding the Wells of Life trip. The August is a primary donor trip, although we will take some some people in March if if they desire to go. Um, my first trip was the life changer. I wrote, you asked to write, ask us to write reflections, and I wrote, I will never be the same. And and largely, a lot of people said the same thing that were on the trips, that the same thing, felt the same way I did. And I'm impressed by the joy of the people, that these people that have absolutely nothing are happy people. And then when you give them a gift, it's it's just phenomenal. I mean, you give them a soccer ball and you, you might as well give them a Mercedes Benz. Exactly. I mean, it it's 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 just absolutely amazing. So, I have a couple of questions on this. Uh, first is let's just go with the first one. How do you convince people to attend one of our trips? Well, I twist their arm as best I can. Um, you know, <laughs> if that doesn't work, then I attempt to uh, bribe them. I'm sorry. I'm, of course, I'm joking. Um, but I make the most concerted effort that I can to share my own story that uh, this had a profound effect on my life. And I don't believe it would have happened had I not gone there. I tell people that if you really want to give yourself the greatest gift that you can be given, go ahead. Give yourself that gift of a personal experience that uh, is going to change your life one way or another. And so I leave uh, the invitation really open there because it has to be the right time for a person. They have to have the means. There's lots of things that have to line up. But for the people that have gone over the last five or six trips, I would tell you that every single person to a fault has come back and thanked Wells of Life many, many times over. And not only that, but they've also began seriously donating because they see firsthand that they are a person that's being used in a tremendous way. Yeah, and you know, and you mentioned the expenses. It's it's on one hand it is expensive, but on another hand you're going 9,000 miles away, flying 21 hours, and you're going to a foreign country and you can do the whole thing for under $3,500. That's including your all of your all of your meals, all of your expenses, your airfare so it's quite reasonable no one's making any money on this as a matter of fact we were losing a little bit of money on it but 
not losing it, it costs the company some money because I don't view it as a, as a loss because of the service we provide. Um, now, tell me even more importantly than, than how, how you convince them to come is what kind of difference does such a trip make in the lives of people that go? That's a great question. And, of course, it's different in everybody's life because uh, if we knew that it was going to have a certain effect, believe you me, we would uh, find a way to bring more people. This is truly a a God-given invitation because when people see that they are in the image of God, they're a human being just like the child that they're seeing at a well, at the mother I think that's just a moment of connection that most people don't get a chance to have. When you realize that we are all made in God's image, and then you can realize that for just a little effort, I can lift that person up, honor them, bring them dignity, respect. Uh, That is something that takes root in a person's heart. It doesn't always, you know, manifest itself in the first weekend when you return. But I've seen people over the next couple of years just grow and blossom into people that are sometimes kinder. They speak softer because they've had an experience where they realize that something got to work in their life that changed them from the inside out. And that is something that no price can put a value on. Yeah, it's the whole the whole cultural difference and 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 what is what occurs there. What well, what I see is really interesting is that um the donors typically have donated a well right. uh and in honor of a friend or somebody or someone who is deceased and they're they're honoring the memory of someone. They get to, we take them to that well. They get to visit that well. And many times, half a village will turn up, and you'll have 100 people. If you're at a school, you'll have 300 people singing, dancing, singing your praises, making poems. They make up poems for, for the donors. Yeah. And donors' lives are you're, you're forevermore changed. You know, I, I wrote after my first one, I will never be the same, and I wrote after my fifth trip, I will never be the same. It's it's the it it is it is so impacting, and people you, you know the emotions are are just varied. People just sobbing. Our people, the donors, just sobbing, not having realized the good that they have done. You know you've done good when you don't go there. You still know you've done good, but when you go there, and you see that what your donation has done. It just makes every penny worth it, that it was just a tremendous experience. Can I just add briefly to that? Because I, I think that there's such an important point there. You know, we always say at Wells of Life that everything begins with a well. And so over the course of the last 10 years, I've seen wells dedicated and donated for many different reasons. And many of them are what you just described. Uh, a loved one. My mother, for example, passed last year at 89 years old, and my family got together and we dedicated a well. And it was something that brought the family together. It brought closure, knowing that our mother, uh, her life was honored, and that it, it represented giving life to a thousand people. You know, we've seen people, again, uh, such as, well, I'm just going to say it, you know, your son, Austin Hedges, the catcher for the Padres. He's a quiet guy. He doesn't want a lot of publicity. In fact, he doesn't want any publicity. He's helped 10,000 people. A young man that's, you know, beginning his career is inspiring so many people that you can still be a top-flight athlete, a top-flight entertainer, a top-flight business person, but you can leave a tiny little bit aside for those who are less fortunate and who maybe have no voice to ask. And I've seen, there's many other, there's musicians that, you know, have, have privately donated. It's special what a well does. I've seen school children as young as six and seven years old bring in $100 that they've spent two months saving. So story go on after United story. United States, United States yes, people. Yes, yes, here in the United States. Yes. Because, you know, once a family gets uh, passionate, as you, you said, Charlie, once a family gets passionate, they see the value of 
using wells of life and funding a well as a valuable service in mentoring, modeling, and teaching their children how to put a value on service, which, to my mind, is one of the greatest, uh, I guess, the greatest attribute a human being can have is to serve others. So I just wanted to wrap a bow around the idea that, you know, everybody listening knows somebody. They may have a coach that made a difference in their life, an English teacher, you know, a mom, a dad, somebody that they maybe have never been able to touch and honor and give a gift to. This is the ultimate gift. And it becomes what I think you've used, Charlie. It becomes a living memorial. It's not a one-time offering. This is a living, giving, breathing force of good and love that, you know, every morning mothers arrive at the well. And there's a dedication plaque at the bottom of that well that he's taken care of and washed and cleaned and cared for, that prayers are given because they may not know that person personally, but as our president, Pete Callahan once said when he asked, who was this person? The answer was, I-, I don't know who they were, but they must have been a really kind, good person. So that's the idea that that's comes from great. a well and dedicating a well to somebody you love and care about. You know, and I- I'm-, I'm thinking as we're-, as we're talking here, I'm thinking of one of our um, attendees on this trip. He he lost a girlfriend at a young age, at a very young age, and he dedicated a well to her. And it was a very emotional experience when he visited the well. And uh, you could tell he was just quite broken up, and we were, you know, caring for him, but also leave, giving him space to, to deal with this. And he shared with us later on that this was the event that gave him closure on her death. Yes. He says, now it means something. I've, I've done something. And, and y- you know, you never know how it's going to affect people. But that's, but that's, that's powerful because he loved, he loved this woman very much. And, and to have something that powerful to, put, to pr- bring some kind of sense of closure to, her, um, to, his, to his experience is, is really something. It's very now, deep. I mean, that's about as touching, I think, uh, as anything can be. And oh. when, a, when a donor travels, uh, then that, that experience really touches their heart. Um, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to, uh, we have, we're, we're going to go maybe about, about five minutes more, which my five minutes is usually ten. Uh, but managing an NGO in a foreign country is, um, has introduced me to a whole new kind of managing and directing. Um, we're 9,000 miles away, and I, I'm, I'm trying to manage directors and managers. And so we've got distance, radical cultural differences. I mean radical. What we consider uh, fraud or embezzlement or bribery, they just consider this is part of business. This is the way business is done. They don't look at it as a bad thing. It is not even considered a bad thing. And so you, you, you have to deal with these cultural differences, and, and you can't make them Americans. We're not trying to make them Americans, but we make our staff live by these certain standards. As a matter of fact, we have a code of ethics that, that everybody uh, abides to. Um, so so you, also have, you also have too much work for too few people, and as a nonprofit, you never have enough money uh, to to uh, because it. In the end result, it requires. I think it requires what you have, and what I'm gaining is passion for the people we serve. It is a passion about why do you, why do you give? I, I was challenged on on a situation that I was giving to an orphanage, and. Something came up that, that challenged me that just uh, someone says, well, because I was a little upset with them about something, and someone challenged me and said, Charlie, who are you giving the money to? And I said, to the orphans. And they said, well, what are you whining about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was it was perfect because I'm thinking of everything these orphans are going to, going to get, and why would I be upset with some situation? Um, but once that kind of passion occurs... It's almost irreplaceable. What do you think? 
Yeah, I think that uh, this work requires uh, passion and then some, simply because uh, if you're looking for an easy retirement, this is not it. If you're looking to really make a profound difference and to really roll up your sleeves and get down into the trenches, there is no more amazing work than doing this. But managing, yes, an NGO on three continents, you have to just, first of all, temper your expectations. Many days I just give, give this over to God because if not, you know, I would become an even more uh, upset and frustrated human being than I already am. But we have learned that what gives us the joy is knowing how many children's lives we saved. You mentioned it at the start of the show. You know what one child's life is worth. I mean, when you talk about 30,000 children, you know, you could... Size of cities. Yeah, I was going to say you could fill about half or maybe even more of Petco Stadium. If we put all the children whose lives have been saved because of your help and donors' help and Paul's help and... What an amazing and glorious image that is, because you will someday, and again, if you're a believer, and I am, I believe you're going to get a chance to meet all of these children in heaven, and they're going to thank you in a way that doesn't exist on earth, because to save that child's life, I believe it's going to be the greatest accomplishment of any of our lives to be able to do that. Boy, that's, a, um, that's an overwhelming thought. I, I, I'm very touched by that. Um, tell me. As we're as we're winding down, is there a downside of passion? Oh, indeed, there is. Like every coin, there's a flip side to it, and uh, I'm pretty well qualified, I think, uh, to tell you what it is, because I, I've suffered uh, what too much passion actually causes. Uh, a couple of years ago, around Christmas time, my wife said to me, uh, "Honey, how come we haven't gotten very many Christmas cards?" Have you upset everybody in the entire <laughs> world? And have you asked everybody for money for Wells of Life? Because we may need a couple of friends. Oh, I say that jokingly, but um, there's always a fine line between, um, you know, trying to push too hard, expecting people to just be, you know, involved in this one cause. So I would say the downside of passion is that uh, it can uh, marginalize the people that are involved. And I think it it, it sometimes can leave you with uh, a few less people on your Christmas card list. Yeah, and it can um, um, it can create unrealistic expectations in you. Therefore, you are disappointed when you shouldn't be. I think that's actually a great insight right there. And I think that's one of the things that I've been fortunate to get some coaching from you on. You know, our expectations are so critical to our personal happiness because I know I've always been goal-driven, I've always been performance-driven, and each year I always have a pretty high set of standards, you know, that I hope to personally reach and that Wells of Life would reach. And it's only of late that I've started to realize that this is not about me. This is not about my performance. This is only about doing the best job that I possibly can and leave it at that. And that's where I'm at in life right now personally, learning to be able to just to balance the expectation with whatever the result is, whatever God brings, that's what I'm going to be happy with. Yeah, I know you're going to get help from God as a result too. Yeah. So let's close with this. Tell me, not all of our listeners can fund a well, and not all of our listeners are going to have a desire to fund a well. Uh, I encourage our listeners to discover a passion with a purpose where you're, where you're doing something. And, and whatever that is, you will benefit. You will, it will be of incredible benefit to you. Um, but, but if somebody does want to contribute to Wells of Life, um, how can they do that? Well, we have something that we've been preparing for quite some time that will afford everybody the opportunity of being part of Wells of Life. We put a name on it, and it's just a simple name called a water warrior. And we've asked uh, a thousand people to join us in a monthly gift of one dollar per day. And before I leave the studio, I'm confident that I'm going to convince the wonderful producer of this show here, Paul Roberts, to be a water warrior <laughs> at a dollar a day. Because that right there, if enough people are willing to believe and to make that 
uh, commitment on a monthly basis, that can literally touch the lives of tens of thousands of people. And, you know, from the very homeless to beginnings, great things happen. You and I have talked about this many times. I'm just inviting every listener of this show to consider making that gift of $1 a day, which is $30 a month, and then see where this leads to. Now, you may not go down the track of Charlie Hedges. That's a very, very unusual and amazing blessing for Wells of Light. But you may get involved in a small group. You might get your church involved, your golf club, your kids, your family, your friends. And someday you might get together and fund a well. And you may even go with Charlie Hedges and see what life in rural Uganda is like. And then you'll come back and say, Charlie was not pulling my leg. He was telling it as it was, life in rural Uganda. And if you're willing to become a water warrior, you're going to really bless many people. And that's the invitation. Yeah, it, it, and, and what, it, what it covers, so our listeners understand that we, we get no operating funds from wells when people give wells. So this goes into unrestricted funds that we can operate. We can pay a chief marketing officer. We can pay... Uh, the electricity bill, the electricity. rent bill, all of the bills, essentially, that yeah. it takes to run a, a growing, an ever-growing uh, nonprofit. You have to, you have to have it. And so I, I would, I would encourage everyone to uh, check into Water Warriors, and I'll put the the website will be on. It's at wellsoflife.org. Very simple, and and you can sign up there, and you can find out all about Wells of Life there. And we're just launching. When are we launching the new website? This week sometime. I believe right? it, it will be. By the time this podcast is aired, the new website will be available, and it really will give you every opportunity to see our videos, to see how you can set up your own well on the website, and how you can come as close as you're going to be able to get on this side of Uganda to experiencing firsthand the work that Wells of Life is doing every single day. Yeah, our marketing officer is working really hard at giving people first standings. Ex- and experience, and we're really looking forward to to the results of that. So, Nick Jordan, thank you for spending uh, time with me today. I also want to thank our listeners for tuning in to the next chapter with Charlie, and be sure to check us out at our website, thenextchapter.life. Until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now. Thank you, Charlie.